<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to the Horasis Asia meeting. Uh, and it's the opening plenary, the grand opening. And we're going to talk about uh, a vision from within, a new vision for Asia. Asia is actually witnessing very good news. Um, RCEP uh, was concluded just earlier this month, and uh, there's a lot of um, optimism now um, concerning trade, a new Asian unity, and uh, a new togetherness where the whole of Asia is collaborating. Um, starting with trade, uh, trade tariffs were reduced or abolished in most cases, uh, and now the, the largest uh, trade bloc in the world uh, has been formed, um, bigger than NAFTA, bigger than the European Union. And uh, today we are very fortunate to hear from uh, two ministers, two secretaries from the Philippines and from Hong Kong. And we are also joined by the uh, Undersecretary General from the United Nations, uh, Fabrizio Hochschild. Um, from Hong Kong joining is Christopher Hui, who is the Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury. Hong Kong, of course, is the financial hub for Asia. So very glad having you uh, this morning, Mr. Secretary. And Thank from you. the Philippines, joining is um, Secretary Ramon Lopez, who is in charge of trade and industry steering the Philippine economy. Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me now first call on Fabrizio Hochschild, who is joining us um, from New York, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, he is in charge of the uh, UN 75, the 75th anniversary of the UN, which was celebrated during the UN Annual, Annual Assembly just uh, recently. And uh, I'm very glad to call on uh, Under Secretary Hochschild. Um, uh, Secretary Hochschild, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to join the Harassus Forum once again. We've seen in recent days major developments occurring in Asia. The landmark agreement for regional comprehensive economic partnership signaled the strong desire to return to ambitious multilateral trade arrangements and will undoubtedly have a profound effect on the region's future. Similarly, changes of leadership in the region, the Indo-Pacific partnership and the consolidation of the ASEAN regional bloc all herald new wins for Asia and for the world. We are gathered today as the world remains in a state of uncertainty with the relentless COVID-19 pandemic prompting new lockdowns in Europe and as dangerous global challenges such as climate change, growing social inequalities and conflict and violence, risk still loom large. In this adverse context, the General decided to launch this year a major initiative of the 75th anniversary, a global listening aimed at gathering the voices of peoples across all of the world. This global accountability exercise sought to re-energize and rejuvenate international cooperation at a time when global cohesion was lacking by collecting the views of peoples on the future we want, the UN we need. We embarked on a comprehensive journey throughout the year to hear the people's hopes fears and aspirations on how the world can come together better to address our global challenges collectively. To that end, we ask people around the world four questions. What are your priorities for post-COVID recovery? What are your priorities for the world 25 years from now? What do you see as the biggest threats to the realization of that vision? What are your expectations of international cooperation and of the UN in particular to solve these global challenges? We've had feedback from more than 3,000 dialogues in person and online in about 100 countries. And we've gathered well over a million responses in all 193 member states through a mini survey. Further, on 21 September, on the occasion 
of the UN 75 high level event of the UN General Assembly, we presented our findings to 122 heads of state and government. The views of respondents from Asia were aligned with global priorities, prioritizing global solidarity, access to healthcare, addressing inequalities, access to safe water and sanitation, and much better supporting the hardest hit communities and countries. Looking to the future, respondents in Asia asked for first, better environmental protection, second, less conflict, and third, greater respect for human rights. With regard to perceptions of international cooperation and the United Nations, over 95% of respondents in Asia believe global cooperation is vital to deal with today's challenges. That's higher than the global average of 87%. It's a strong testimony to the value many people in Asia place on countries working more closely with one another. In complement to our survey's figures, we also commissioned a study by the Edelman Intelligence Group, which found that people in Asia hope for more environmental protection and for more peaceful societies in the future. However, there is grave concern among our respondents in Asia the government corruption, violence, and the condition of the environment will worsen in the future. From the UN perspective, we were encouraged to see that multilateralism is alive and well in Asia, and that Asian people's aspirations in this regard are translated into growing multilateral integration in the region, with ASEAN, SEO, SAC, and PIF helping to promote regional cooperation. The empowerment of regional organizations remains at the heart of the Secretary General's strategy for the United Nations as a means to make multilateralism more inclusive, more effective, and better networked to address challenges at the global, regional, and national levels. It's noteworthy that ASEAN, despite its very contrasting political systems, cultures and economic levels is in many ways a model of unity and an inspiration for other countries to come together. It's also noteworthy that the forum of small island states gathering 42 countries is chaired by Singapore and is one of the most vocal platforms of support to the United Nations and to multilateralism. Still, we face large challenges. Like the rest of the world, the Asia region, with all its disparities, is reeling from the impact of COVID-19 on its health systems, on its economies, in causing greater social inequality, and more broadly, a setback on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. To recover and build back better, we need more international cooperation through the United Nations and through regional organizations with support also from forums like Horasis. But most importantly, we need to listen better to the voices of people, especially of young people. And we need to remind ourselves that the long road ahead must lead to delivering better for the most disadvantaged, whom we are here to serve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Undersecretary General. And uh, as you said, uh, multilateralism is back. We all have to join hands. And you also focused on regional partnerships. Let me now welcome our moderator, Norman Perlstein, who is going to uh, moderate the remainder of this session. Uh, Norman, uh, it's uh, up to you. Um, Frank, I, I hope you can hear me. I was having a little bit of trouble hearing the, the last speaker. So if you don't mind going with the next question, I'll try to get the sound better so that I'm able to hear. Uh, sound is all fine. I think you can just go ahead. It's all perfect. 
ask you to continue just because I'm, this connection is so unstable coming through my hotspot. Yeah, let me first maybe ask a first question and uh, introduce uh, Secretary uh, Christopher Hui, who is in charge of financial services and the Treasury. We heard about um, the good news of multilateral agreements, of course, ASEP, uh, Hong Kong being the hub for Asia for financial services. What is your vision, uh, Mr. Secretary, for, for Asia in the coming years? Um, how will it be and how will Asia unite and what is Hong Kong's role in that? Um, thanks, Frank, and this opportunity for me to share with you all and this distinguished audience our vision for Asia. Um, as the Under Secretary just mentioned, um, of course now we are dealing with many immediate challenges, including COVID. But that said, I think we need to cast our sight a little bit further, looking into what are the key trends that's going to drive Asia and to see how different jurisdictions, including ours, is going to ride on those trends in order to further our development. And I would say that, first of all, uh, Hong Kong, among other jurisdictions, have been a huge beneficiary of globalization. So despite the challenges to multilateralism, as the Under Secretary just mentioned, I think we are a keen supporter to globalization and free trade. And that's why on that front, um, we are actively in negotiation to allow us to participate in RCEP. At the same time right now, among those RCEP jurisdictions, we already have uh, free trade agreements with um, the mainland, with um, Australia, ASEAN and New Zealand. So all these kind of agreements will underpin our going support and also our future direction as a supporter of free trade and also liberalization. That's number one. And number two, I think there are a few lessons that we have learned from COVID, uh, which I would also like to share with this audience. First of all, uh, is the importance of technology. Because before COVID, of course, different jurisdictions tried to push for the wider use of technology for a cashless society. But I think COVID brought to us an immediate question in terms of the need to necessitate and also expedite this progress. Because after all, there's a huge con health concern that prompt people to pay. And that's why on that front, we are expediting our effort to make sure that at the retail, institutional, and also at the government level, we are pushing forward for wider theological use in such a way that we can have a faster way forward to a cashless society. And on that front, there are a number of things that we are being planned. First of all, we will push for a scriptless or the paperless stock market. And it's something that we are keen to push through in the coming year. And secondly, we are going to digitize our pension system in a way that all the relevant admin functions will be centralized. And also more broadly, we will facilitate the development of our fintech companies here in Hong Kong. And right now, we have more than 600 fintech companies already being hosted in this territory. And many of them, in fact, have innovative solutions in support of new technology and new economy. So we want to bring them forward and also facilitate their collaboration with our established financial institutions in Hong Kong in such a way that we can further grow our fintech ecosystem. And on that, we are going to push for a subsidy program to subsidize our fintech companies to have the solutions being adopted by our financial institutions. And of course, as uh, Frank just mentioned, Hong Kong is a financial hub. And we're also very keen to see what are linkages that we can bridge in terms of making sure that our financial services are supporting our real economy. And right now, since the adoption of listing reform, we have already have a very strong cluster of new economy companies listed in Hong Kong. And they could be related to e-commerce, biotech, so on and so forth. Because right now we allow and also we list companies in the biotech sector with no revenue. And we are already seeing a very strong cluster of companies on that front. And in fact, many of those biotech companies that we are listing here are producing or are supporting many of the research work related to COVID. So you can see the link here between financial services and the real economy and the immediate health issues that we are dealing with. So this on the first bit is on technology. 
And another key trend that we observe arising from COVID is the importance of climate change and also the importance of sustainability finance, as the um, under General Secretary just mentioned. Um, if you all of you uh, study accounting or risk management, normally in the past we have a quadrant, i.e. we try to divert the divide the risk that we are facing in terms of the probability of the occurrence and also the level of risk that we are, have to deal with. So normally we are told that we only have to deal with the risk which are at the top right hand corner which is the quadrant relating to risk which are having a high probability of occurrence yet at the same time have a high risk level. But I think COVID uh, brings to such a different scenario. Even for those, those risks which are deemed to be unlikely or very, un, very, very not very probable, now they are something that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And that's exactly what we are seeing here on COVID in the sense that all these health issues that are deemed very remote and also very distant, but now is something at the forefront. So we are not just dealing with risk which we are deemed to be less probable. We are dealing with risks which are having huge impact on the community, yet right now may be considered less likely. So on that, I think it changes the whole way we look at risk management and look at ourselves in terms of our capability to deal with risk. And among other things, I think sustainability is an issue because after all, um, the whole world, in particular, many of the emerging countries are dealing with this situation in terms of how we can prepare the community to deal with these long-standing climate issues, which may not seem very probable before. So it's something that we are addressing right now. And in the policy address that's just announced by our chief executive last week, we are already committed to being carbon neutral by the year 2050. So basically 10 years ahead of our own country. So we are doing that as a kind of benchmark and target in such a way that all our other policies can follow through. And on that, the government is very committed to sustainability finance. And in the coming five years, we will issue around 80 billion US dollars of green bonds as part of our green bonds program. At the same time, um, we have our inaugural green bond issuance last year of uh, 1 billion US dollars, not a sizable amount, but it was hugely popular with four times oversubscribed. And also we have managed to draw investors from Europe and very keen to work on. And also as we develop our sustainable finance landscape, what we are quite keen to do is to make sure that our community at large, in particular our young people, are aware of the benefits that sustainability finance will bring them. Because as the under general secretary just mentioned, the need to engage young people is of paramount importance. And that's why just following our inaugural issuance of green bond last year, we just issued our green bond report, highlighting how our proceeds in terms of green finance are being applied. And basically, in terms of our government green buildings, in terms of our recycling facilities, we are applying the green proceeds that we gather in various public power projects. And we also try to engage our community in a way that they are fully aware that finance is not something up in the air, but, but it's something which is close to their mind and something which is related to their daily, daily livelihood. So there's something that is, we are always keen to work on and we also look for collaboration with the different jurisdictions across Asia and also the world to ensure our vision in terms of technology and sustainable finance in Asia is achievable. Thank you. I wonder if I could just follow up on that very illuminating com uh, commentary and just ask about um, the role of education um, in terms of uh, getting a younger population to truly understand the existential nature of uh, the issues related to climate change. Have you had to um, do much to change curriculum to educate young people to this very important issue? Mm. Uh, uh, thanks, Norman, for this very good question. Uh, I must say that uh, in terms of our new generation and young people, right now they see issues like green, justice is something very close to their heart. Like if you interview some of our young people in Hong Kong, some of them will sh tell you that they may look at the carbon footprint of the universities before they apply. So there's something in terms of how the government and also how our education system should do in order to cope with this new mentality. And on that, I would say that uh, we are doing our utmost in terms of spreading 
the policies and also impressing upon the community the sustainability effort they were putting putting in. Because if you look at like many universities in Hong Kong, like for example, the School of Engineering, now they are also very keen to have their graduates not just working in engineering companies, but also in green finance. Because they see that an energy and engineering knowledge is equally applicable in the financial services side and also in the other areas which are related to green and also to sustainability. And that's why recently uh, we have a uh, two programs, in fact, trying to create limited job opportunities for our young people. And we are talking about 2,500 job opportunities. And the purpose of these programs is to help our young people, especially in this time of economic downturn, to support them with government subsidy in such a way that they have have a real opportunity of working in different companies in the financial service sector in such a way that they will keep their work at the same time have the experience relevant to their future career. And these programs are very successful because, after all, if we look at the profile of the companies that we apply for, basically 90% of them are small and medium-sized enterprises. And also, um, around 30% of the applicants who are given these job opportunities are actually below the age of 25. So you can see that in terms of mentality, in terms of creation of job opportunities, in terms of policy support, we are taking pushing forward various measures on various fronts to make sure that our next generation are up to speed in terms of how the change will bring about to the community and the world. Frank, if, I, forgive me for coming in late as you know, I had uh, some technical issues with uh, my internet connection here, but were you able to run the film? Um, that uh, Yes, yes, uh, we did already. And, um, um, maybe you would like to call on um, Secretary uh, Lopez next, and then we can open up for discussion. Yes. Um, well, why don't you go ahead? Because I'm, as I say, my my connection is so unstable. Sure. Yeah. First of all, thanks so much, um, Secretary Yu, for this very enlightening uh, words. As you say, Hong Kong is the center of globalization, and it's also uh, what I would call an avant-garde because you're very much into the tackling of climate change, uh, looking for. Uh, the new, uh, the future of work as well, combining the financial industry with the real industry. And I think that's really the magic uh, match. Let me now uh, call on Secretary Lovis. And uh, the Philippines have been one of the fastest growing economies um, in Asia uh, in the last uh, three to four years. And uh, observers talk about the the Philippine miracle even, you know, with, with uh, uh, suddenly, you know, Philippines opening up, uh, attracting so many uh, foreign direct investment as well. Uh, trade is happening. Uh, what, what is the secret of, of the Philippines and uh, what is your policy as secretary in charge of uh, trade and industry? I think uh, you have to unmute. Um, it's still muted. Hello. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Thank you, yes. thank you Frank. Thank you, Norman, and uh, Minister Wee, and uh, to our colleagues. Uh, uh, well, well. first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for inviting us uh, to this uh, Horaces uh, Asia meeting. Thank you for giving us uh, the honor to speak before this gathering, um, the region's most senior leaders in business and government. Definitely, the present pandemic has caused uh, significant economic, political, and social disruptions that have affected people's lives and uh, livelihood as well. And economic uh, activities around the world are, are really affected. Because of this, um, many governments have implemented health and safety measures. Uh, in, in the realm of trade, we, we, we saw a lot of non-tariff measures or some restrictions being applied. Uh, in a report by the UN Conference on Trade and Development, nearly 80 countries and territories took some action to ensure that goods in high demand, such as medicine, food, um, and the medical supplies, uh, would keep flowing to their citizens. Um, meanwhile, the International Trade Center reported that during the pandemic, 139 economies had issued a total of about 295 trade related measures, of which 156 were restrictions on the export of uh, medical supplies. Uh, just uh, for the information uh, of the body, the Philippines did not 
again, did not implement export restrictions, uh, at, even at the height of the pandemic in our country. Um, likewise, in our own survey, we surveyed 235 Philippine exporters, and of this number, about 42% said their businesses were really greatly affected by the pandemic, uh, despite being allowed to operate in the Philippines' own community quarantine lockdowns. And this was because of the lockdowns implemented also by other nations. And this had caused, of course, a cancellation of orders for many Philippine exporters, which affected them uh, financially. Uh, these uh, disruptions uh, call for a collective course of action to strengthen and enhance economic cooperation uh, as we revitalize business activities and uh, communities. I think what I can say also is that we just have to stay the course. And uh, one thing that can aid in this action is the historic signing of the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, uh, that would include ASEAN plus uh, five uh, FTA partners. And it's considered you know, modern, high quality, um, mutually beneficial agreement. Uh, this, this will definitely also complement what, you know, the, the reforms that we're, we're doing in the country. We're into a lot of uh, a very aggressive uh, infrastructure development uh, program, build, 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 as well as uh, continuing liberalization uh, in, in many sectors. Uh, just about, I think, a year or two years ago already, we, we've even liberalized a very sensitive sector, uh, and that is the rice. Well, and, and, the, and we've liberalized it uh, totally, removing all uh, import restrictions. Um, and, and, and this is basically just to allow a, a freer flow of goods and essentially have a better uh, supply and as well as uh, fr prices and food security in our country. Uh, we continue to do structural reforms uh, in, in the country. Just recently, about last week, our Senate has finally passed a, a more, uh, I guess, aggressive and relevant uh, tax reform measure that essentially will lower uh, tax rates in the Philippines from 30% to 25% and eventually to 20% corporate income tax rate, as well as provided other um, incentives, uh, in basically an improvement in the incentives regime. Um, other other reforms that we will continue to, to follow and uh, follow through, and that this would be in the retail trade, in the public service, and essentially uh, that the Philippines is uh, just trying to uh, liberalize a lot of other sectors so that we can encourage more inflows of uh, investments, whether local or or foreign. And uh, good, a good thing is that uh, recently uh, we are in a good run, about four consecutive months of increasing FDIs and. You know, pandemic affected a lot our economy, um, uh, but uh, but we're seeing some signs of recovery in terms of uh, GDP, unemployment uh, started they started to pick up as we reopen more sectors. Even our sec our, our export sector that uh, dropped by fifty percent, almost half uh, at the start of the pandemic in the lockdown, during the lockdowns, it suddenly went up already two percent two point two percent last September. You know, uh, so it, it's a we are quite relieved, but definitely it, this will be, it will take more time to go back to the pre-COVID levels. I mean, there are still risk uh, factors that we are looking at, but at least the signs of recovery is giving us a bit of uh, optimism, cautious optimism moving forward. That, that's all for now. One of the um, questions that has come up quite frequently is whether in the future uh, multilateral uh, negotiations will be the most effective way to move forward or whether it will be much more of a bilateral relationships um, because it's, uh, it's just so difficult to get consensus from larger groups. Um, I, and yet, when you think about the kinds of problems of the, for the future, I think one thing that we all can agree on is that no, no country is an island uh, and that uh, it's very difficult to think about ways in which some of these very difficult problems can be solved, except in a multilateral uh, setting. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that from a Philippine perspective. Oh, certainly. Uh, that, that's a very good uh, observation. Uh, we certainly believe in, in multilateral uh, arrangements. 
uh, and 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 that's the reason why we, there was this active uh, push through of uh, the RCEP, even though it took us, I mean, as a group, uh, eight years to negotiate on this. But certainly the drive was there. Um, but but on the side also, Philippines continued to to pursue also bilateral uh, relationship, bilateral free trade areas, uh, and and uh, we are uh, free trade agreements. I mean, and and we are right now in talks with uh, like Korea and uh, trying to start with with other countries. Uh, we've just also closed uh, a, an FTA with uh, EFTA countries. Uh, hopefully, we'd like to push through with the, the U.S. as well as the EU. Uh, Philippines uh, believes that uh, certainly we would like to, you know, we're, we're opening up our economy in the same way that we would like also to have increased market access for our country to, you know, to, to, to benefit from. So all, all these FTAs anyway are perceived and, are, and, and should be uh, mutually beneficial uh, arrangements. And then that, uh, and so in answer to the question, uh, we have to pursue both. Multilateral is definitely very important, but, but bilateral would have its purpose as well. Frank, uh, did you want to pick up? If not, I can continue. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Norman. Well, it, it was just a question of if you're hearing me. Okay, just as a follow to that, um, some of the very important areas for the Philippine economy in recent years have certainly included a number of um, citizens who've worked um, outside the country and um, and conversely, uh, the development of centers for providing service for other uh, countries um, in fact, when I was trying to sort out my um, technology problems this afternoon, um, it turned out that our tech support was all coming from uh, Mindanao. And mm -hmm. so I got a firsthand observation about where I have to go for, for support. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious whether you think these are remain important areas for the economy or whether over time uh, either – the domestic demand or competition from abroad may make these areas uh, less important for your economy. Uh, well, that's a very good uh, observation, and and uh, we're, we're happy to be giving that service. Uh, yes, was, I had to go all the way to Mindanao to figure out how to get a hotspot that could work with this computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yes, certainly the IT BPM uh, sector is uh, would still and uh, has been also the uh, a fast growing uh, sector in the Philippines with its huge uh, resources of uh, of uh, labor uh, and and high highly trainable and very skilled. Uh, certainly, really is a, a big advantage for us to fill up the requirements in the fast-growing IT BPM sector. Despite the, the growth in technology, it's now technology, people working with technology, and then and probably that's one of the reasons why they were able to reach out to you and uh, provide the assistance. And it's still a fast-growing sector. It is uh, definitely, in fact, one of our, our highlights uh, and uh, a key sector that we are pushing for, uh, together with electronics, which is our top goods exports, and, and in service, it would be the the IT BPM, and uh, there are a couple of other manufacturing uh, activities that uh, we are pushing for, like aerospace, electronics, and and even uh, copper, uh, the copper industry. So we we the, well, the Philippines simply is uh, doing its best to uh, promote sectors where we believe we have a, a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, at the same time, we're really much embedded in a, a global supply chain, um, and as we saw in the pandemic. Uh, and it's also giving importance to the RCEP, which provides for actually 50% of our exports go to RCEP countries. And we source 68% of our imports from RCEP countries. And that's how important, I mean, the, the, the global supply chain is. And uh, that, that is where we simply have to continue and pursue this process of uh, multilateral, uh, I guess, unity and, 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 and trade uh, order. Uh, and uh, certainly, these these are sectors. IPPPM would be one 
in participating uh, or included in these uh, kinds of uh, agreements. Maybe just taking it back because COVID is so much on everyone's mind is uh, I think many of us are asking the question, well, w- w- what's the next um, the next challenge? Uh, is this the first of many pandemics and have we learned lessons about uh, cooperation and sharing uh, not only um, research information, but in in really trying to understand um, the source of some of these kinds of global phenomena. And um, I'm curious whether uh, you find that especially young people in the Philippines are uh, really understanding uh, in a way the, the importance of group reactions to uh, these kinds of uh, tests that we have not had prior experience with? Well, uh, everybody has, uh, has adjusted, uh, I would say, in this kind of uh, environment. Moving forward, definitely uh, healthcare industry and, and, and you know, health-related uh, services and activities have really been uh, highlighted and and I guess moving forward, that would be the uh, one of the priorities set in even in our uh, identification of uh, priority industries. Uh, healthcare has been uh, now included uh, as a priority sector, both of the manufacturing as well as of the services uh, field. Uh, we're, I mean, Philippines is also a big supplier of um, uh, health workers uh, around the world, uh, doctors and, and nurses and uh and even in the country, we, we continue to uh, churn out. I mean, I mean, a lot of graduates in this field. Uh, so certainly, uh, this would be the the way forward. Um, technology as well as in pharmaceuticals and 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 uh, medical devices manufacturing. I mean, our country at the start of the pandemic. Uh, it's you know the anecdote here is that we had zero uh, production uh, capacity for even. Uh, uh, coveralls, you know, the one that the PPEs that we use now. And uh, one of the early activities that we did during the pandemic is to repurpose some of our manufacturing, just like just like in a war when you try to repurpose manufacturing companies to produce uh, weapons and all that during the Second and First World War. In, in our case, we started to convince some of manufacturers to produce coveralls, medical grade face masks, and we are now I mean, after about five or six months, we are able to produce ourselves now uh, these coveralls needed for PPEs uh, from zero capacity to about, I think, three million a month uh, of capacity. And even medical grade masks from, we, were, we only had one manufacturer before, an exporter, which we did not impose import restriction on. We allowed them to, we allowed them to export despite the need for medical grade masks. Uh, but now that two million and we import asking other companies to to open up and operate uh, a medical grade mass. We are now doing, I think, about 60 or over 60 million a month uh, capacity for medical grade mass. And we are now able to catch up with, with this requirement. So these are just, I guess, examples of, of how we are all, I mean, all countries are adjusting to the, to the pandemic. And definitely this will be the new normal. And now we're talking also of uh, having a system of strategic stockpiling uh, and there are bills or laws uh, to be issued in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure uh, who else is on the call now, but I do think that you raised some very um, interesting points with regard to healthcare. And, and of course, the Philippines has a long history and tradition of, of, um, of healthcare, I, I can remember from my own years flying from Hong Kong to the Makati Clinic uh, when it was, you know, producing probably some of the best medicine in the the region. And I'm I'm curious about whether, um, if you will, uh, medical tourism might be one of those things that we would see more of going forward. Uh, yeah, uh, that's true, Norman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that's very true uh, in the field of uh, healthcare. Certainly, uh, medical tourism is now has uh, medical tourism has now increased its uh, prominence, uh, and uh, where Philippines can can have a, a good, uh, I guess, niche uh, moving forward. Uh, prior to to we've started a bit on that one, uh, but 
I guess what was really getting to be popular that before COVID was the retirement ha haven. Uh, but now medical tourism definitely would be one that uh, is now given uh, emphasis. Right. Well, I thank you very much for your participation. Again, my apologies to everyone on the panel for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm wishing all of us uh, a much smoother and better um, conference as we go ahead. And uh, Frank, as always, thank you for pitching in for me. Um, I think this is not the first time you've had to do this, so I'm especially grateful. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Secretary uh, uh, Norman and uh, all Secretary Hui. Uh, I think it was an amazing uh, opening plenary, a lot of uh, optimism. Uh, we didn't talk to, about the U.S., Norman, because I was about to ask, you know, what uh, will be President-elect's view on Asia? Right. Will he come back? Sure. Will he come back and be maybe part um, of TPP or even RCEP, yeah. but we've seen, I think that's um, uh, the big question. And uh, I just wish, you know, that America and Asia could uh, re-engage in the future. Right. Even. Well, I think that Biden has many friends throughout Asia and his appointment of Tony Blinken as a secretary of state was really um, uh, a recognition of the, the importance of experience uh, and um, I think that uh, having